tell me like, oh, that's good, but I would do this and this and this. And he always gave honest feedback for how to make something better. So I wanted to, to spend the last 10 minutes here kind of delving more into uh, the personal stories that I have with him. And there's one memory that I'm going to close it out with, and then I'm going to think for a second for another memory now of... Uh, Ah, all right, one just came to me. So um, it was 2011 or 10, I'm not sure, but we were in, uh, Mishima was in Seattle to cover PAX Prime or PAX, PAX West as it's sort of unofficially referred to as. But we were there um, obviously covering the event for Respawn, so he was there cutting, and then me and Sark were there, and I, I guess probably Nanners too, right? Because depending on the year, actually. But... Um, he came to cut, and then me and and Sark came there to produce and host, and then I was just a host. Like when I, whenever I went to trade shows, it was always sort of Sark running the show, and um, that was sort of the case for Respawn altogether. Although Sark was was always like, if you have feedback, throw it in, and Wood w- always had like really funny suggestions. Him and Sark are both action movie fans, and so they think with like 80s and 90s action movies in mind and finding a way to not maybe not parody that all the time but like maybe make an homage to it and make it funny at the same time those guys that's that's how they work and they do that really well and um getting sidetracked we were in seattle for pax and um where I am sort of a compulsively social person and at times can sort of shut down and want to be by myself for a little bit Wood is, um, I wouldn't say that he's compulsively social. I would say that he is, um, and I wouldn't say that he is antisocial. I would say that he's social, but he's sort of shy at the same time. I think that he likes being around people, but I think he more likes to observe than anything else. Because if you look at the nature of what he does, it's not, it's not detached. I don't want to say that because he's very much involving his own creativity in that process, but it's a very personal process. When he's editing, he's not necessarily like asking people and working off of other people. Whereas me and Sark, it's like, we have to work off each other. And if he's in a bad mood, which he never was, Sark was like always a pro. So I should say, if I was in a bad mood, then Sark had to be the one to like, all right, how am I going to work with this? And like, we sort of developed this ongoing, um, not character for me, but, they called it Angry Hutch. And so Wood would, would like yell at me like, do, do the Angry Hutch, do the Angry Hutch. And that's when you'd see me saying, so like, fuck yourself, Nanners, like that stuff. And um, I was like, Wood was coaxing me along for the longest time. And in fact, there was a time that Nanners and I didn't hate each other, but we, uh, <laughs> we just did not get along for not too long, not too long. I mean, I am, I am friends with Nanners to this day. And I and I I don't have any problem saying that. And I've talked I've talked about that, and I'll talk about it more in the next video. But, um, <laughs> so like, we would he knew that me and Nanners would butt heads, and then he would, for the sake of video and entertainment, sort of gently encourage me to explore that. <laughs> and so I would uh, end up just screaming in Nanners' ear for five minutes, and then Wood would like cut some video out of that or something, and um. Okay, so we're in Seattle, and uh, like I said, I'm sort of compulsively social, and I think Wood's social, but he's more more reserved, and um, we were at a company dinner, and I remember this dinner was so funny, because Sark ordered, um, like, the most expensive thing on the menu, because it was uh, paid for by the company, no, it wasn't the most expensive thing on the menu, but he ordered something, and the portion ended up being, like, that big, literally, like, that big, and everyone at the table ended up laughing at him. And me and Wood was sitting right next to me, and we could not stop laughing. And so Sark, out of frustration, was like, well, I need something else. So he got, hey, hey Mojiro, say what's up to everybody. Go down there. So he got frustrated. was like, well, I need something else. And so he ordered a dessert, and then the dessert was even smaller. It was like that. So, uh, but during that video, like, at, at one point, like, at, like, I noticed that Wood wasn't saying much, and I was really tired because a lot of the times those conventions can sort of, like, emotionally drain me. Not because I'm scared, but because it evokes a lot, lots of feelings of excitement, and catharsis is the come down from that, and it, it can kind of make you tired. And so I remember sort of looking at him and thinking, like, you know, not, not, thinking, not wondering if he was okay or anything like that, but, um, because I never worried about him like that, but I... I think he's the one that said to me, he was like, hey man, you want to get out of here? And I was like, yeah, actually. And um, 
everyone there was still eating dinner, and so, you know, some might have thought that that was rude, but no one did. It was just, we just decided, like, all right, let's take off. And from that walk down by, um, I think it's by Pike Street in Seattle, where the wharf is, on the way back, I just made this conversation with him, and I think that was the first time and the only time he really ever um, told me about, like, how do I explain it? He, he told me, he said, you know, sometimes I just, I just prefer to be by myself. And, and, and that was the first time I ever heard him like volunteer words about himself to me. And so I was like, yeah, me too, man. And so we just like kept walking and, um, and, and got back to the hotel. And was like, I can't even remember what we really talked about, but that was like the first time that I ever saw that side of wood. Cause he's so usually not shut off, but he doesn't volunteer information about himself very readily. And so when he did that, I took that as a gesture of friendship and ran with it. And to this day, I still consider him a friend. And um, and I'll close it out with this story because this is the most important story there is and, um, when it comes to Wood and my experience with him. When I, I might have told the story too before, but um, right before I was about to leave, I was really grappling with the decision and... Um, and I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't talk to Sark about it really until the very end. I didn't talk to Wood about it until the very end. I didn't talk to... And we had just gotten these two new producers. Juan moved up from programming. So he wasn't new. I knew who he was, but he was new in a producing role. And Mondo, who had just come over... You're okay. You're all right. Just if you don't step in... Okay. And Mondo had just come over, come over from G4. And, um, and so here were these two new cast members and Nanners had just left. Nanners left Machinima. There is no it pisses me I don't know why it pisses me off, but so many people don't understand. Like, I don't work for Machinima, he doesn't work for Machinima. We're we are like private contractors at this point. And we we're more intimately involved because we have history there and so if they ever wanted me to come down and do um I don't know, like a skit or something like that, all you gotta do is just call me. I'd be more than happy to come down there. Um and and I think they will. I mean but right now like APL's taking up his mantle and they're doing their thing and I think they're doing great and, I, and especially APL's just looks so comfortable up there and um okay so getting back on track uh I didn't really tell anybody about what was going on because I couldn't feel like I could get like a biased or an unbiased response because I felt bad that Machinima had sort of um elevated me to a position of someone who was kind of valuable to the company because I was a face to the company and I had a hard time grappling with the responsibilities that came along with that, including the responsibilities to take care of myself. I just didn't know how to do it. And Wood walks up to me and, and he, uh, he had spent the last couple of weeks like kind of trying, like I would just go in and like, I wouldn't say a word, I would put my headphones on. I would start playing Modern Warfare 3. I wouldn't stop until we were ready to shoot. Then I would shoot. And then I would say, I'm going home. And then I would leave. And finally, after about two weeks of doing this, he, he taps me on the shoulder and he goes, Hey man, What's, uh, what's up? And it was one of those things where it's like you've been working right next to him for two weeks. Both people clearly know something is up. And, and he finally took the time to, I shouldn't say finally, I'm not owed anything. He took the time to sit down and ask me, what's up, dude? And I said, uh, you want to go outside? And I just laid myself bare in that moment. I'm like, I'm not happy. I don't enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I don't, and because of that, I feel like I don't know who I am anymore because who am I if, I, if I'm... You know, who am I if I'm not me? And um, and I told him, I said, I feel trapped, man. I feel trapped. Like, what am I going to do? I have nothing back at home. I have nothing. This I left nothing to come down here. So if I left, I'd be going back to nothing. And that, which sounded so awful in my mind. And I think maybe that's the trap of not financial security, but not j that's a part of it. But just YouTube in general, you, it gets you accustomed to a certain way of looking at the world or viewing work. Um, and it is work, but he, uh, he very, very calmly, um, with a smile on his face too, which is why he's so wonderful at times, but with a smile on his face, he just shook his head and said, I, you always have options and I want you to stay, but if you got to go, you got to go, man. And, um, who knows what's going to happen down the line, but right now, I think you just need to get back to yourself, and I don't think you can do that here. So if you want to go, I think you should do that. And he just lit this fire in me in that moment. I'm like, yep. I literally walked right into the double doors, right into my boss's office, knocked, and I said, can we make time to meet later? He said, sure. 
We had to wait for like three hours. And so I'm sitting there like <gasps> having like a panic attack and stuff. And I, I sat down in the office. I, I don't remember if I cried. I think I might have. I was just like, it's hard to tell a company like that. Um, I can't do this anymore. And, um, and I sat down and, and Ralph was my boss at that time. Ralph and Rob, Rob Talbert, who were both professional, wonderful people. Both of whom never, ever were uh, cross with me, even though I was sort of being difficult for a minute while I was figuring out what I wanted to do. In fact, Machinima had given me the entire month off in February, and so I felt so bad because I had come to them before that saying, I'm going to explode. I, need, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. And they said, take all the time you need. And I took a month. And, um, and I came back and I tried to make it work, and, and, um, and it wasn't working. And if it wasn't for wood, I don't know how much longer I would have stayed there. And, I, and if, I, if I would have stayed there much longer, I, don't, I, mean, I probably would have never like got back in contact with Liz and then get fucking married. I don't know, I don't know if I would have done those things had it not been for his gentle and friendly and yet firm and assertive um, push in the right direction. And for that, and for him just laughing his fucking titties off all the time, I am so grateful that he was down there in L.A. to make my time easier. And in fact, I'll end it with this. There's, a, there's this real moment, moments with Respawn, and maybe one of you guys can link it in the comments, but it was one of the last real moments with Respawn before I had taken off, and it was we were doing a, um, a skit outside on the gravel rock area where the picnic benches are, and we were shooting this skit, and Sark started doing this thing where... A lav mic is a uh, is like the little mic that you attach here. The the wire goes down your shirt, and I think Sark just gets ideas and just expands on it and finds humor in it very easily. I think that's his gift, and he did this whole bit where he just couldn't. <laughs> he kept on trying to fuck with his lav like while I was talking, and so he'd every once in a while look over at me, and then and then the whole it was just so random, and I don't know why Wood thought that was so funny. Um, I was so sad that day, and I like that was one of the days where I was really confused, and it was just I, I wasn't sleeping much at the time, and I felt awful, and I didn't feel like I was funny or, enter or entertaining, and I didn't feel like I wanted to be. But Wood, for whatever reason, thought that Sark messing with his love was just the funniest thing ever, and he started laughing, I think, harder than I've ever heard him laugh. And, and I think maybe that was like him catching up, because <laughs> we hadn't done that in a while. We hadn't really relaxed and had fun. And so when he did that, he broke the ice and like opened the floodgates for me. I started laughing from my soul and it felt so good. Cause like when you're upset and confused and you don't know which way is up and someone makes you laugh, your your someone makes you laugh from your like spirit, then that's so healing. That's exactly what you need in that moment. And I think that's, I think that's Wood's gift. So if Sark's gift is being really charismatic, and sort of guiding you along as an audience uh, in a way that is crafted. Um, I think Wood's gift is sort of like throwing kerosene on creativity. He's got his own brand of creativity that shows out, that shows in, in the videos that he cuts, but I think that his biggest contribution to my life was like he really did throw gasoline on, on Sark's creativity first and foremost and, and my own creativity. And he's just an inspiring guy. And uh, if you guys... Follow him on Twitter. Tell him Papa Hutch says thanks for everything. And um, in fact, I'll give him a call like shortly after I make this video. But um, what if you're watching this? You uh, impacted my life in ways that I don't think I ever told you, but I don't think I ever had to because you and me always had that. Uh, like even if we're not like the best of friends in the strictest sense, like even if we don't call each other once every month or two months or three months, um, I still consider you to be someone that's like very very dear to me and if you ever need anything I'm like six hours away man um, you literally changed my life I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you I don't think and I can't thank you enough for that and um, stay frosty you're a good man I hope you're doing well buddy uh, so I think that's gonna be my my video on on Hollywood Angels I hope I hope that you guys took something out of it I hope that you guys can appreciate the individuality a little bit more of the people that 
you guys have come to find to be like specific kind of personalities, but maybe don't always understand that part of it is a performance and a show. And yet, like, yes, that's us, but it's us kind of with like some pepper on it. And Wood without pepper is a really, really um, still fun guy, but he's a very thoughtful. Thoughtful is a, the best word that I could. Thoughtful. That is the word for Wood. But if I had to give him a few more words, I would say he's thoughtful, impassioned, very creative. Inspiring, professional, polished, proud in a good way. I believe that he's very proud of what he does. I believe that he likes that he can edit well, and he should because he can edit well. Um, and I think that he is very, like maybe the last word I would give would be gentle. Even though he's huge, and I worked out with him for like th three months, hard, like he fucking destroyed me but um the workouts he was having me do i don't know I, matter of fact fuck you for doing that wood i'm glad i stopped working out i'm actually not i'd like to quit smoking that'll happen eventually but gentle that would be the word for wood because you you'd look at him and you'd expect that he would be someone that would fucking just take you to the ground and i never i, I never saw him hurt anyone <laughs> I never, I never saw him have to. He was just always so nice. He's a, he's a huge, gentle giant that will fuck your ass if you fuck with him. That's, that's how I view Wood. A big, gentle giant who will always be nice and considerate and caring, but the second you cross him, that dude's going to end lives. And uh, I hope I'm not there when that happens one day. Actually, I am. I would like to see Wood kill someone, sort of objectively. Maybe someone from Thailand? Do they have documentation over there? Like if someone disappeared, would anyone notice? I don't know. Well, let's go to Thailand. Give me a call. All right, hope you guys enjoyed the video. And let me turn off that notification. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. And let me think a little bit about what I want to say about Adam and Anders and, and my time there with him. And I will make that video probably in the next few days. And hope you guys are doing well. Bye. Look at the sky. The sun won't Yourself, what keeps you trapped inside? Look at